Okay, why don't we uh, let's get going, you guys. Um, uh, so, what do I uh, wanted to talk, uh, we're going to be talking about flooding uh, and such today, but um, obviously a big war has broken out in, um, in Europe, and so I think it's important to at least just sort of touch on some, a few things here relevant to uh, our class. Um, this, is, this is obviously not a traditional um, disaster the way we've been talking about it. As we mentioned before, uh, specifically the definitions of environmental disaster, natural disaster, all those terms, and if you recall back to the start of the semester, those things explicitly excluded war, right? Explicitly excluded people actively wanting to fight with each other um, uh, as a disaster. Nevertheless, these activities um, uh, clearly can, you know, cause all kinds of knock-on effects. Just like we, we've seen with other disasters, it might start with a wildfire, and that's, you know, obviously a horrible thing and causes problems, but then the wildfire might beget a landslide, which is another disaster, right? All those sort of secondary um, disaster, secondary knock-on effects. And so the same thing obviously happens with war. Um, much of the war in the last many years has um, taken place in, in faraway places um, and uh, uh, in places with not maybe the most robust infrastructure, et cetera. That's not so much the case here uh, in terms of what's happening. A couple important things we'll note. Uh, uh, so this is Ukraine, obviously, and this is the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine that is going on as we speak. Um, uh, it, it sounds, by all reports, that Russia was thinking they would just blast in, do their typical stuff like they did with Syria and elsewhere, and just kind of go, oh, well, you know, tough, tough, we're here. Um, but the Ukrainians have shown a lot of resistance, and that's translated into slowing down the military progress. But that's also, it, it, you know, stopping them from getting to their, their objectives, which appear to be to execute the government and, uh, and put in a puppet regime. But regardless, um, this slowing down has all kinds of consequences. So one of the things right here, we've not talked about nuclear accidents yet, but this is Chernobyl. Uh, this, uh, was, uh, th this happened on my 16th birthday um, and was this uh, uh, massive radiological leak, um, meltdown of a reactor. Um, so Russia, n Russian troops now control that part of uh, the Ukraine. So obviously you can imagine in war people do horrible things. They blow up stuff and shoot at things and it's a desperate time. Probably not a great thing to be, to be fighting around a um, you know, nuclear, uh, what's now called the sarcophagus, this sort of uh, concrete tomb that goes over that area. In addition, we have reports of some major oil spills. Um, uh, as, as different uh, areas have been become, come under attack, et cetera, um, and so on and so forth. So, um, well, the purpose of this is not to talk about uh, war, per se. Um, there are a lot of parallels with our disasters, right? And one of the most important things I want to um, just emphasize is um, information and how information comes to you and to me in today's uh, in today's era, right? So historically, last many decades, when something would happen, a hurricane would hit, an earthquake would hit, um, that'd be horrible. You would have reporters would go in, people that, that it's their job to interpret, right? Maybe they're not all great reporters, but nevertheless, that's their profession, is to, to synthesize information, uh, you know, take all these different sources, suss out which one is right, which one's wrong, who seems to be telling me something not really right. Um, and then uh, only trust the person that, that seems to be, um, you know, speaking the truth, et cetera, maybe some firsthand accounts on, the, on a phone call or something of that nature, and we would get the information. Obviously now the big uh, way information is flowing in these uh, time critical moments is through social media. And so social media can be a very powerful tool. It could also be a very powerfully misleading tool. And so um, 
Uh, while in disasters, we don't typically have people actively, consistently trying to mislead us, um, we sometimes do. We sometimes do. We also have a lot of folks that may not be intentionally trying to mislead us, but um, just might be spreading a rumor that they heard, you know, trying to be um, helpful or, or thinking they're not doing anything wrong. And, and both of those sources, active misinformation and unintentional misinformation, can get really blown up and can, and can um, start to drive the narrative even. And so we're seeing that um, in this event. So again, we're seeing that with active propaganda on both sides. We're seeing that active propaganda from the Russians and active propaganda from the Ukrainian side. And so it's just one little example, um, this. So, so this was a story that started circulating on Friday. <laughs> What people are calling the ghost of Kiev, which is this um, heroic Ukrainian fighter pilot that was shooting down invading Russian mix and this this um, you know that looks super real right that, that, that looks that looks I mean I'm not a pilot but that looks you know like a airplane in the sky and all that kind of stuff um, that's not real right so um, this was this was um, a, a computer generated simulation uh, using some popular software. The gentleman that produced this, and you guys can go and, and read the Snopes article on it if you want, um, but, but the gentleman that produced this actively said, hey, I made this. This is not a real thing. Well, let me step back. So there, there, may, there seems to maybe have been a pilot, uh, uh, some, some Ukrainian pilots that, that shot down some uh, Russian MiGs, right? Russian fighter jets, uh, but um, but it's but you know it's it's as in all these situations, right? This guy maybe shoots down one plane, then it becomes two, then it becomes three, then it becomes four, and you know all that kind of stuff. And so this the gentleman that made this uh, fake video said he did it to honor this guy. He did it as an example of what he thought he was doing. And then quickly that I think this was that gets retweeted reposted, whatever, and th that context gets stripped away. And then it becomes, oh my God, so the people are sharing this video and it looks, you know, when you're on your phone, especially you can imagine if you're you know, a refugee getting out of here and you're looking for some hope, like, oh my God, this is great, you know, bo boost your morale, etc. And that's how this stuff can, can spread. So, so it's always hard to sift through um, information, this sort of just spitting out fire hose of information um, in the best of times, but in a disaster context, and God forbid, in a war context, it is really hard to know what is legit and what is um, not. And so, so the best things, when we do have these events, the best thing to do is to actually you know, rely on, again, those, those folks that you've been following for a long time that you know are reliable, folks that, again, that their profession is to is to um, uh, you know, collect facts, interpret facts, report facts. Um, they have the resources, hopefully, to vet if these things are, are true or not. And so, again, a, a, lot of, a lot of broad similarities to when we have disasters break out. Um, uh, I can list any number of examples, but for example, uh, Cal active propaganda would be an example of Cal fire saying that drones are a danger for airplanes fighting wildfires. Um, that, was a, that was a political decision they decided. Absolutely, drones can be dangerous when people do stupid things to them, but they were nowhere near the danger they, they were presented to be. Um, in, in the case of California, we waited for a reporter to go at, walk up to a CHP guy and say, hey, can I fly my drone to take a picture of this wildfire? And the, and the reporters, and the, uh, excuse me, the CHP guy said, yeah, sure, whatever, that's cool guy flew it up, then Cal Fire grounded all its airplanes and said, oh my God, this is a terrible threat. We, we need a law 
and this is super dangerous. And so they, they, that worked. So, the, so CAL FIRE got a law passed in California saying anybody that flies their drones around uh, in a disaster area is, can go to jail and all this and that. And so, again, clearly there's yahoos that do stupid stuff and people shouldn't be you know, willy-nilly flying stuff. But, but you get that type of, of um, active misinformation that comes out. And then we get things like uh, when in New Orleans, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, when we have you know, total chaos, city flooded, which we haven't talked about yet, but we will, um, and all kinds of craziness. And what happens? Um, people start claiming that there's snipers taking shots at the law enforcement, the rescuer folks. So that slows down people trying to rescue folks from their homes because now everybody's wearing bulletproof vests, they're they're working in teams, they're they're you know carrying weapons and all this kind of stuff, and and it just and that information came from the police, from the New Orleans Police Department, not an active attempt to misinform, but rumor and rumor and rumor get get muddied up, and all of a sudden it becomes oh my God, people are, are snipers are shooting at uh, firemen, policemen, that kind of stuff. So. So this notion of, of having a good baloney detector, of having a good way to interpret facts is always important, but particularly in these really crisis situations, natural disasters, but one example. Cool? Any questions about that or any, any comments you guys had?